Hello and welcome to theCUBE Pod, episode 50, Dave. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante, in our studio. We're here all week with SuperCloud Day. We're going to do the pod in the Palo Alto Cube Studios. Great to see you. Love being here, John. This, is, this place looks great. <laughs> we'll get the stage set up. We just had our live stage performance here this week, SuperCloud 6. The theme was AI Innovators, which will be an ongoing series with theCUBE. Obviously there's a lot of AI innovators to highlight and people trying to be AI innovators. So we're going to continue to cover AI like a blanket, um, but just a, you know, an amazing week. I mean, we just had like great stuff in studio. We'll go back to the anchor desk and get some stories out there in the CUBE conversations. Of course, you get the Boston and the Marlboro Mass studio uh, and just keep on getting that content. But it's been an interesting week. You got the whole TikTok. Um, About vote. that. That was a huge, um, you know, government starting getting the policy of- Did you see Mnuchin? Mnuchin says he's putting together a group to buy TikTok. Of course, they're never going to let <laughs> that never happen. happen. China's never going to let that happen, but it's kind of interesting. Yeah, it's just former it, Treasury Secretary. It just goes to show you how the tech platforms are now becoming like what looks like utilities. We've said on the previous pods that you know this this could be regulated, but this, there's so much going on. I mean, that's a big story um, on Silicon Angle. We have a lot of you know funding news going on. You're seeing a lot more. Um, what's going on, what's next. We had um, some great startups on here in Super Cloud 6. We had Kyle Weller from One House AI. We had Venkat from Rockset. They're doing stuff that's unique. It's not just like one trick pony kind of solution. They got everything in there. They got this new systems that are building, but just overall a great week. Um, Uber and Walmart, I thought were really, you know, practical uses of, of AI. You know, what came out of, <clears throat> what came out of that is this, this is going to be the year where experimentation gets into you know, reality. And I think actually, on the one hand, Uber and Walmart are actually applying AI in a big way, but most, most customers are still in the experimentation, uh, experimentation phase. John. I mean, just tons of funding round together. AI closed another huge round. Um, Databricks is still red hot. Uh, unstructured raised 40 million from, I think it's series B. Um, another $50 million financing round. Um, Cerebus Systems, debuts water, um, a, a wafer scale AI training chip. Anthropic releases Claude 3, and that's now available on Amazon. That was pretty much big news yesterday. Yeah. Um, and then Vast Data continuing to show their partnerships. And you got GTC around the quarter, you got KubeCon, and we're going to be at the Broadcom Financial Analyst meeting next week um, during um, the same week as GTC from NVIDIA. There's a lot of activities going on. A lot of people are going to be in Silicon Valley in town. You're coming back out. Yep. So that should be a great week. Zscaler uh, <clears throat> bought Avalor, an uh, Israeli-based company, to kind of consolidate and curate uh, security data, yeah. kind of tie it into metadata. Doug Merritt was on that board. I think he still is. Yeah, and, and we, they, they raised 30 million. I heard the, the, the number was like 300 million that they... Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, just, it was just a great week. And of course we had, uh, you know, last Friday, International Women's Day, Savannah did a great job at... Uh, Amazing down. job. Down there, it's best one we've ever had. And we've been into every single WIDS. Yep. Yeah. She yeah. did really outstanding work, and she um, <clears throat> one of the things she did is she asked at the end of each for every guest, like, what advice would you have for young women? And so we got some good content coming out of that. Yeah, you know, Savannah did the best. I got, I will admit, I will say Savannah's WIDS was the best we've done there. Yeah, yeah. She really has the the mojo when it comes to doing women in tech interviews. Um, her alignment, obviously she, she understands it, but she really probes the personal side of it, which I like. And also she ties in the news and she ties in also the thematic of what it was, but she kind of brings out more cultural themes I like. And I think that has more legs as we do more programming out, it'll, it'll run longer, it has more meat. So, you know, it, it's, it's good to have, get those extra story nuggets uh, in the interview style. And I think that's great for She's us. She's really good at active listening, you know, and engaging with, the, not only the guests, but also the audience. So I, I really like it. She makes time. it fun too. Yeah. Um, what else is going on? Um, just a lot of um, AI discussion around OpenAI's video, Sonora, with Wall Street Journal had a great article. I thought uh, Joanne Bell was probably one of the best articles I've seen. It's like great video, 10 minute video and story with the CTO of OpenAI. And they that went into amazing. how good it's getting, but also the flaws and, and the fusion models are, are getting better. And it's going to come up with the whole, what is real? Of course, she, they pivot to the elections, you know, what's real, what's fake. Um, and you got to watch out these days. Uh, my son Tyler was saying on our family text, you know, when you answer the phone from your bank, don't use your original voice. 
because when you answer the phone, they might be capturing your voice to do voice activation. I, I'm the same. I, I go, <clears throat> hello, hello, you know? <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> you have muffled voice. <laughs> Who is this? <laughs> yeah. Um, but, um, you know, John Chambers was on the Cube, Cube Pod. One of our earlier Cube Pods said voice will be the killer app. Remember yeah. he said that? Yep. He, so he nailed it. In companies that are actually being able to authenticate. So. So Microsoft, Microsoft had big news with the Copilot for security. I saw Sean Bice, who's been working on that project, former Amazonian. Uh, Sean Bice is in the security with Charlie Bell. He's been working on Copilot from the beginning. He was at RSA last year, almost came on the Cube, but the PR police said, no, you can't go on the Cube. <laughs> so he promised me, Sean, if you're watching and listening, you got to come on the Cube at RSA this year. We definitely want to have you on and, and uh, tell Frank Shaw we said it's okay. Uh, I'm sure he's going to be like, yeah, no problem. <laughs> um, but just the, the funding, right? I mean, you know, you got a Series B for un unstructured $40 million Series B from Menlo Ventures at a $230 million valuation. I mean, the company just started, okay? So you know, you're starting to see the valuations um, to move up a bit, and I think you're starting to see a speed game. And, and again, Dave, I want to get your thoughts on this. Because see Wiz? No. Wiz had an $800 million round at a $10 billion valuation. Wiz is a cloud security company, very hot. Remember last year, the, the line outside their party at RSA, mm -hmm. right? So they're, they're, to your point, I mean, it's just valuations in AI and cyber are still. I saw great. Wiz two years ago when we were at an Amazon Marketplace event. Uh, Wiz. Wiz, Wiz, and um, like they were just growing like a weed. And I yeah. talked to some of their, their early employees who were there representing them on the partner alliance side that, um, they're like, oh my God, it's crazy. And they were the fastest growing startup ever. And then one year they started, went right, really, they went straight up. And, and they up. are really high in the, in the ETR spending data. And then then you saw the, the Hammer, did you see the Hammerspace meta deal? Yeah. That announcement? I, I don't did. know what that's going to do to Hammerspace. That's Dave Flynn's company. I don't know what it's going to do to their valuation, but it can't hurt. Yeah. Very technical blog. I, I started to read it. It looked like a good somewhere. pivot to try to get into the vast swim lane. I mean, vast success is looking really good right now. Right. So. I'm thinking if you if you're in that market, you look at vast data. You say, "Wow, I should get into that." So I think, I think you know, you're going to see you're going to see this pattern, and it happens every time. You, you and I both talk about the historian kind of view of the um, cycles. Once this emergent embryonic market hits, the patterns become clear, clear visibility on the on the swim lane of the opportunity, and then everyone snaps in line. And, so it usually takes one or two players to see it, and then they go boom, they go right on it, and then everyone goes, "Okay." That's the model. Let's pivot behind that trend. That's the market. And once the market appears, it's a race. And then it's going to be th full throttle. And then it's going to be like the NASCAR. You know, who's in the lead? And, and then ultimately well, someone will take it away. The, the interesting thing about that, that Hammerspace, uh, Facebook or Meta announcement was maybe not so much even Hammerspace, but the Meta piece where they're going to basically, you know, build open source tooling. And so Charles Fitzy and I, <laughs> We're always debating. He doesn't <laughs> believe that Alibaba is actually a hyperscaler, so we debate about that. He obviously doesn't believe Oracle's a hyperscaler. I, I don't count that. He calls him a clown, not a cap. Yeah, but I, I don't count Oracle as a hyperscaler either, but I think they have a great business, and we, so we debate about that a lot. But I think, so I asked him, Do you, can you concede that Meta is actually a hyperscaler? So I think Meta could actually, you know, in this AI race, come out with, I mean, if they choose to have an enterprise class, open source, you know, managed service for AI tooling and you know, compete with the big three US hyperscalers. What do you think about that? I mean, I think Oracle's in the mix because if you go back to Oracle and you think about the, some of the words they used just years ago, engineered systems. Um, when you look at all the, the GPU action, the clustered systems we've been calling them, they're basically engineered systems and they're built for high performance. And at the end of the day, when you start getting into this next wave, it might come down to, hey, I'll put all my cloud dogma aside. I want performance. I want ease of use. I want performance. I'm going to throw workloads out a bunch of big iron. Give me the performance I need. That's all I want. And if someone's got a better performance mousetrap, that might work. And I think that's, that's a, a viable scenario. We were there when Larry announced, the Cube was there at, at their, the Oracle headquarters when Larry announced the original Exadata, you remember that? I do, and, and, and it was so fast this was as hell. a while ago. This it was, was fast like, as hell. It was like early last decade, but so it's it's proving out to be the correct move. And Oracle, you know, all time high for, for stock, and they had great earnings, they had solid earnings, I should say, but the, what's getting people excited about Oracle is their CapEx spend. And, you know, Charles Fitz again, he poo-poos it, look at it. Oracle compared to the hyperscalers, of course, but Oracle's 
CapEx is starting to grow um, and they're forecasting more CapEx, so people are getting excited because that means that along with their RPO uh, forecast, which are growing, in, indicate a lot of cloud demand. And the thing about Oracle's cloud is it's really, really friggin' profitable, okay? So they've got the database, they've got the autonomous database, they have their applications that are being powered by that autonomous, da autonomous database, and they own all the infrastructure underneath it because they build it themselves. So Safra Katz years ago realized, wow, after you know, we bought Sun, we can actually integrate this hardware. We don't need HP hardware anymore. Remember <laughs> HP Oracle, how yep. famous that was. Yep. We can just do our own. So they captured all that margin and they get software-like margins, not hardware-like margins, much more like you know, Amazon and, and Microsoft than say Dell. And so it's an incredible business. It's, it's pretty interesting. I mean, at, at SuperCloud 6, we had a lot of conversations around like what will be the infrastructure of the future and the big takeaway from SuperCloud um, AI innovators this week was the infrastructure work that's going on right now is pretty significant. A lot of people are grinding away and working on how to make that faster, scalable, but also stable because there seems to be a lot more momentum on the app side. I see open source and the proprietary foundation models are, are getting a lot of attention with um, you know Anthropic now running on uh, our cloud, cloud three out and Amazon's now got it in bedrock and it's available. Um, you're going to see a lot more action. So as developers start cranking away on the AI apps, they got to run it on something. So managed services will take the first hit of those. So you'll see a pop. OpenAI will get a pop. Anthropic will get a pop. So I think OpenAI is the Microsoft bet. Amazon's going Anthropic. That'll be kind of a managed service to run embeds and all kinds of things through Claude and or OpenAI. And then as companies start using the AI, the next question is, what do I do? I got to host it. So do I host it on premise, which they will. How do I, what, what do I host it on? Do I host it on rack and stack servers or a server under the table? Or do I put the, a clustered or purpose built you know, engineered system together or HPC kind of vibe? Or do I go to a specialty um, uh, uh, GPU cloud like a Core Weave? Weave yeah. So these are going to be decisions that are going to evolve. And I think when you look at some of that middleware glue con, uh, code, you're seeing companies come out saying, hey, just buy us and we can do all these things. And some of the old moves might not be available. So like observability is changing radically because uh, there's new needs. Um, you got AI, for instance. AI is very network based now, Dave. So like you got to need network traffic if you're going to use AI, if you're in the infrastructure. So, you know, at KubeCon next week, Rob Streche was talking with me last night, our, our Cube research analyst leading on the whole cloud native side. The, the AI at, in the infrastructure is going to be really DevOps like cloud operations, AI ops, you know, what's going to connect systems? How do we make it stable? How do I provision microservices? How do I manage it at scale? And that's data that's data driven. So you got to have the data, right? So, so. And you can do that stuff on prem now and at the edge. Yeah. Right? And so you're going to. You always point out the cloud operating model. You know, you're going to see a lot with AI, it's going to change the game to basically, you got to be in control of your own data, whether you're a pre on premise or whether you're a publisher. I mean, the story of Google's coming out with a new generative experience. I want to get that whole segment later, but like Google's got this new search yeah. generative experience that's going to cut traffic to sites. So you got to go direct. So I, want to, I wanted to pick up on something you said about uh, the, the sort of AI deployments and what's happening on prem at the edge, if, if I can. This was a, not a good week for semiconductor stocks. They, got, they kind of got hit and we're going to see next week at GTC and we have the Broadcom financial analyst meeting you know, semiconductors obviously at the heart of AI, but there's a big discussion going on in the industry about what, what you're going to be doing at the edge with, do you need GPUs? Uh, or can you use, you know, basic, you know, simpler, more cost-effective CPUs? And I've always felt like, okay, you, you know, when you look at what's happening with ARM and, and iPhones, these are GPUs inside of that. So Bikram Joshi, who was here, he didn't come on SuperCloud 6, but he was, he was here hanging out. We tried to get him on, we just couldn't. Um, he's the you know, founder of Compute AI, and he was telling me that, look, these, these workloads, this matrix math that you do at the edge, you know, it's, it's actually pretty simple math, but there's a lot of it. So you're actually going to need GPUs. So this is a big debate now. I saw an announcement with you know, ARM and this company doing stuff <laughs> in chips with Intel yeah. and blah, blah, blah. And, and people are hoping that you can use you know, general purpose CPUs because they're way cheaper. But he's basically saying, you know, the, with the, to your point, with the amount of data that you're going to need to process, 
That's simple math, but there's so much of it, you're going to need GPUs, is his argument. So we'll see how that plays out. You're going to need though. GPUs. You need to have them working in a, a new kind of system. I mean, this is where, I mean, remember the old days of the PC, right? You know, as the PC motherboards got better and better, they got, they had to put more chips on and make the processor, you got memory. And so it was a system architecture, it was a motherboard. And you put it in a, in a shell, and it was called a PC. If you think about that same concept today, it's not the PC anymore or a server, it's, the, it's all the other machines. So yep. it's logically like a PC, you got to have components and you're going to have a central processing unit, you have GPUs, all kinds of processors, all have to work together and be connected. Okay, so that connection is network based. And that's not, where Broadcom not, comes in that's and, where, and NVIDIA. And too. that's why at Broadcom we had an MWC, we wanted to get Charlie on because he was a featured interview because what Broadcom's doing is the future. The connected systems have to be, are going to be large scale, I mean, I don't want to say the word mainframe, Dave, but like, remember when I, when I worked at IBM right out of college, they had the term called big iron. Remember that? This is big iron. Okay, big it's iron. It's liquid cooled. <laughs> it weighs like 70 pounds. Big iron, man, a mainframe Tens honking machine, takes up a whole room, glass room, you know, air, AC's on, all kinds of power. Um, and it did, it did limited things compared to now, but now the big irons kick ass. It's so huge and it's so high performant. Um, that's going to be the future. And by the way, the constraint is not the size of the motherboard, like in the PC, the constraint is power and cooling. Right. And and so, okay, you're gonna have to really make these big iron systems engineered in a way that's gonna have to maximize the resources available. And that's why you're seeing cottage industries pop up like cloud insurance. A startup we interviewed this week <laughs> is doing basically GPU insurance. I'll insure your capability and capacity, and if I don't deliver, I'll pay. So that's like flood insurance, Dave. It's like, you know, it's like, yeah. And you know, it's yeah. like, hey, let's get some flood insurance. All right. Yeah. You talked about, you know, Charlie Kawas. He, this is where he was, he's talked about chiplets and I've sort of been, you know, okay, help me understand where chiplets fit. But this is where, you know, power comes into play. And then the other thing you, a couple of times this week, referenced the Jensen uh, conversation at Stanford. Yeah. And you remember what he said there, he said, you know, in the future, every workload is going to be accelerated. What is he saying? He's saying every workload is going to need GPUs. Now he's so biased, but he's been right a lot. Yeah. And so, you know, basically, you know, he's always talking about Moore's Law is dead. Well, one of the things he said that was interesting, and I, and I want to bring this up because not, no one's in the industry is talking about it in the Gen AI space. Everyone's going gaga over Gen AI prompt engineering. Right. Okay. He was saying prompt engineering has prompt engineering under the covers, but he was essentially saying there's going to be the, the two waves are engineering uh, prompts and responses, and then reasoning. So to your point about these workloads needing you know horsepower, you're going to have the use case where there's going to be stuff going on in the in the, in the workload or application. We say, okay, I'm getting answers, I'm doing some stuff, I'm computing stuff, and then say, oh, I want to reason. Send that workload out to a probably a central cluster and go crank it away and give me the answer as fast as possible. So that reasoning is a little bit deeper uh, system two thinking, he called it, yep. um, which we called, you know, first principles kind of thinking that we would do as humans. Like, okay, I'm going to go think on a problem, not just say, hey, Dave, how's your day today? Great, John, thanks for asking. How's the weather? Looking good outside. This you is know? really interesting what you're saying because he, his point was, look, when you ask ChatGPT a question and you want an answer pretty, pretty quickly and you get it pretty quickly, but what if you said, hey, I'm going to ask a question, you know, help me think through this business problem and take a day, you know, or yeah. spend this, spend a thousand dollars, spend fifteen hundred dollars on solving that problem. And I don't really care how long it takes. If you come back in a week, that's cool. Yeah, do with your me. best. So, yeah, do your best. Imagine if you were able to, you know, have that, you know, patient, <laughs> patience and let AI, you know, run for a week. So I thought that was, you know, pretty, pretty amazing. Now, I wonder where, you know, Grok plays in all this because they're the super low latency chip company, right? So I wonder how that all fits in here. I, I don't know. I mean, we need to think about. Well, that. we're going to continue to pound on that. Um, there's a story on uh, Ad Week today. It's all over the net about Google Search. This ties into a panel I'm doing uh, for Ray Wang. Ray Wang's hosting this thing uh, this week around um, ethics in marketing. It's talking about some of the analysts firms out there that aren't that are kind of doing uh, unethical things or or or, yeah. dis or it's disclosure, or, really, isn't it? Yeah, it's a disclosure. You, but you're speaking on that. Yeah. I'm, and you're, you're, I think you're going to talk about how to build organic audience, which is what we've been doing. Yeah, I mean, I think it's years. more of, I think there's a lot of um, confusion and desperation around how to, what, how to, be, how to make money. And um, 
you know, I predicted this 20 years ago that ads going to cr crumble, ads will drop, banner ads, and then that uh, you'd be more reputation. We're going to talk about reputation. Um, but I think a lot of people are flat footed of the fact that they can't make money. So what they do is they'll do whatever it takes, and sometimes they won't disclose anything. So we're going to talk a lot about that. But the big Im impact is, is that the market's evolving. So you got the role of influence relations and PR and AR. That, that panel's going to be about that. But the Google news is about the AI impact. And this is kind of ties to why that panel exists because there's so much fake news, so much fake information. So you have the rise of fake analysts, right? So, so that's what I'm going to talk about that some people just really aren't analysts. They're just like either uh, marketing specialists or PR people. So you can't say you're an analyst and not be an analyst. So, so I call it the rise of the fake oh, analyst. Well, you can say you're, a, you, you, anybody can say they're an analyst, and, right? I mean, but, I mean but, yeah. So I mean, what's an analyst? No, but right? analyst gets access, analyst, this is Ray Wang's point, analysts get access, analysts have, um, get paid a bigger piece of the pie because they, they have higher impact. But you can't, if you're faking it, then, then you're basically one getting paid that someone else isn't getting paid and or or yeah, you're right access. about that. I mean, so, an analyst gets paid ten, between ten and twenty thousand dollars a day. You know, for a really top yeah. analyst, maybe the top top ones. Yeah. You know, I mean, analysts like analysts one. are the high priced uh, service. And so, right? so you know, if you're a high priced service, you have to have an elite level of service. You can't say I'm a service provider at the elite level. Yeah, it's like uh, juicing yourself up in baseball. You know, steroids. Like I mean, I'll tell you this: when I was at IDC, you know, we we knew what an analyst was. An analyst went deep into a domain. He or she you know, at IDC, of course, you quantified those markets. And I, I knew more about the markets from a quantification standpoint than virtually anybody on the planet. Because, I, you know, that's what we did. We did that every day, all day, and we were the best at it. You think about Gartner analysts. Gartner analysts are very good. Everybody likes to shit on Gartner, but they're really deep experts in their particular domain. Now, over the years, you know, some of that's morphed, right? <laughs> it's sort of been, some of them, the, what is an analyst has been watered down and you've seen that. So Well, well the, thing, the thing is that there's different, there's a, there's a bigger spectrum of services available that analysts can provide, right? So you have hardcore, old school, pure analyst model. Independent. Independent, right. doing independent research, tons of, uh, tons of work and that, that research, that analyst research stuff and has results and presents it to the, the community at large and the community will debate it and or digest it or versus pay, doing, and pay for it. Versus doing advocacy. Now, and, and or getting advice. Well, companies should like, hire the, hey, you're an expert, I'll hire you, help me with my business. Yeah. I'm going to a market, my product's positioned properly. They get paid for that service, they get paid handsomely. Then there's other services like marketing services. Like, hey, you know, help me amplify, um, my, do an ad for me. Hey, I'm an analyst and I love this product. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. As, as long, long as you just say it. As long as it's disclosed. Yes, this is what yeah, we do. Okay. And so I was talking to Jason Bloomberg about this. Uh, he is a great service. He provides advice. He's a great researcher. And he writes for SiliconANGLE. But he's got a marketing service and he's really clear. This is what I do. He's not hiding the ball. He's not saying, hey, I'm a marketing specialist, but I'm going to act like I'm like a real analyst and, and get paid and be positioning myself that. And that's the difference. If you're just, there's, there's no scoreboard. So again, my point is, I do think actually, we we'll add one thing. I think it's okay as long as it's disclosed, but I also think just from the ethics of, of an analyst, you don't ever want to change your opinion because you're getting paid. And I hope people don't do that. I, I think that, you know, you, you can't, you can't put lipstick on a pig and say, okay, I, I'm getting paid to say this. I mean, that, be a spokesperson. You can't do that as I mean, an you, analyst. You can't, you, have to, you can't can say every company's going to be in the next big company. No, you have to be. <laughs> <laughs> and say, I was right about that. To be true to yourself, and that's why I like to use data. That's why I love our yeah, partnership yeah. with ETR because we have data, yeah. and we have our own data as well that you got to bring to the table. So opinions yeah. without you got to call you got to call the balls and strikes right. You can't say everything's a strike or everything's a home run. I mean, I saw analysts out there. They get out they get out there and they say every company is going to be the next big thing. So statistically, when it becomes a well, big thing, they say you know, and you can't. You can't say, okay, I'm going to say nice things about a company that pays me, and I'm going to, I'm going to say negative things about a company who doesn't pay me just to get them to pay me. I mean, I, I, I know why personally as an analyst don't play that game. I mean, I'll tell, I mean, Snowflake's a great customer of the Cube, we know that, but we, we were the first to report some of the challenges that we see with Snowflake and pricing. Oh, but it's also they were doing a good and we job. Talked to those it's guys, also but, they were doing good work, so it's, it's easy but, to compliment someone who's actually doing a good job. Well, that's true. But when but someone the hits a home run, you say, "Hey, they just hit a home run. It's a nice but, one." But the point I want to make, and sometimes this happens, is when you you have a customer who's paying you, and then you say something that they perceive as negative, but you know you have data. I mean, in this particular case, we're talking about. We talked to many, many practitioners. Who say, "Well, it's just too expensive to do that data engineering and data pipelining inside of the Snowflake. So we do it outside of it. We either do it in Databricks or we do it in Amazon." you know, with, 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 with Elastic uh, uh, MapReduce, et cetera, EMR. It's okay. 
so Snowflake here says, hey, let's talk about this. So you have an honest yeah. conversation about how they're addressing it. Other companies will, I've had this happen to me, say, hey, I thought we were friends, or hey, we're paying you. And I'm like, I don't give a fuck if you're paying yeah. me. So what, don't pay me then. You know, take, here's your money back. I, I mean, this is my reputation. So you, yeah. I think as an analyst- Well, this is the reputation. This is why I brought this up. I didn't want to go into that tangent and go too much a rant on that. Because we'll talk about it on that webinar today at one o'clock, but um, the issue of generative AI and fake information um, and hallucinations brings up, and also the ability to do content better and faster can will, will arm someone who's not as deep to look deep. You've said it many times that ChatGPT takes an elementary school student and turns him into a Princeton Ivy League grad. Yeah, at least you know, from a writing standpoint. From a writing standpoint. Yeah. But, but now you have other things, coding. So um, I brought this up because in our business, the media business, which I'm going to be talking a lot about on this panel, Google Google's using search, search engines changing. They're using their generative AI experience could cut organic traffic to publishers as much as 20 to 60%. So they have this new generative experience where you type in something and, and they'll, they'll create the content for you from sites that they've been crawling. So um, it's premature to, in, uh, to create, to understand the impact according to Adweek. But what this means is, wow. is that imagine if search traffic goes away. I mean, we know how much search traffic comes to our site. And that's why I think, traffic, that's why I think with AI, you're going to see a shift towards reputation. And again, mm -hmm. not to tie the analyst piece into it, that's only one dimension. It's happening in every industry where you have vanilla and or fake content masquerading as truth. And you're going to start to see um, attention and influence become a really interesting power dynamic when you start to think what's reputable. So the question isn't so much who's the best and you can judge content by, the, by its content, maybe it's a watermark or whatever, but you're going to start to see a trend towards direct response, direct navigation to sites, direct navigation to communities, where reputation will be defined by the quality of the work and the people around it. So if Google takes the search traffic, and stay with me, the point is, 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 is going to come. The search traffic goes away, then you're going to have to have direct navigation to the site. These people have to go as a destination saying siliconangle.com. And so you have to change the entire behavior of the franchise. So it's a huge blow to journalism. Or right? you're going to have to put the mm -hmm. content, you like the term watering holes, you and Rob Stretcher, you went out to put that content into those watering holes. Yeah, and, right. the, and, the, and the problem back Which, to the- by the way, is always how we've done it. Yeah, that's what, that's, <laughs> it's, it's, been, it's been our model. But think about the people who make the good content. It okay. costs money. So if you, don't, if you can't monetize that, you get desperate and you do desperate things. The New York Times, so, they spend on their news desk. I mean, it's got well, they have subscription business, but that, if they take the New York Times, Wall Street Journal out of the big, the big outlets, yeah. they got revenue streams. They got events, they got subscriptions, and then they got some advertising. But that's going to kill the, the 1B tier and below content. And what's going to happen is you got to figure out how to monetize. So what people are doing, that they're, they're groping for anything. I'll do video and I'll bump up the views, or I'll do this, I'll do that. So the journalism, are, they're the ones paying for it. Now, Google's enriching themselves off the work of the journalists. Oh, so, so this is a huge, huge thing. So you know, back to who, how to make money, to whatever, whether you're talking about analyst relations, whether you're talking about journalism, whether you're talking about digital marketing, money making is going to change. We predict, again, I predicted this 20 years ago, that when this crashes, it's going to be about reputation. And I think the good news is we prepared ourselves, but it's going to be a complete shock to the system. Uh, and we're already seeing it play out like these panels is today are on. It's going to be talking about why people are doing this, who pays for what and what service. And I think you'll see it normalized, but at the end of the day, it's going to come back down to if you can have good content and you can attract an audience, okay, that audience can be merchandised and monetized into a way for advertising type thing, where that advertising will be, will be um, community-based. So to me, it's clear reputation will be number one. If your reputation is, I just want to make a quick buck, then you can't fund content because it's not sustainable. Yeah. So, by the way, Charles Fitz responded to me. What did he say? He said, the whole, just to set it up, I said, can we agree that Meta is a hyperscale cloud? And he said, came back, he said, hyperscale on their infrastructure, but not a cloud. They have a history of pulling the rug out from under the devs, which by the way is true. So it would be an uphill climb. Then he says, their AI strategy is very unclear beyond open source software. Well, well, okay, but I think Fitzy still owns a lot of Microsoft stock because it's clear to me that they see what's happening with open AI, which was supposed to be open, you know, <laughs> open source, and, and they closed it up. And so I think Meta is saying, hey, we're going to contribute to the open source community. But um, 
But he did make some good points about how they have pulled the plug out from underneath the, their developers, as has Twitter. I mean, we've seen that. We were, <laughs> we were, we were at the butt end of that as a, as a Twitter developer with our, uh, <laughs> with our crowd chat app. Yeah, he wasn't really high on Oracle. Who? Charles? Yeah. No, he's down on Oracle. He, he like negative on Oracle because he's, he's all things Microsoft, right? Because he used to work there. He bleeds Microsoft and obviously, you know, smart guy. He's like Kubernetes is next. Of the came from TikTok. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's very clever. Well, I love, funny. I love like, Charles. It's like Sunday like Live on Twitter for tech. It's really funny. Yeah. Um, he, but he's yeah. smart. He's, he's on point too. But the thing is that I think, I disagree. I think Meta is well positioned. I think. I do too. I think their scale could be a great resource. I think they could, they could be the next AWS if they play their cards right relative to AI, and I think, um, and, and as well as obviously Google, because they, they can just use their open source devs and use their power with the models that they got. So um, if they do that, then they could rock and roll. Yeah, and I don't want to beat on the whole open AI structure. The, the all in guys, the all in guys that unpack the structure. We did that a year ago on a breaking analysis, <laughs> but but it's it's very timely now, right? With Elon suing them, but. Um, you know, the TikTok thing's interesting, John, if I could for a second. I did a Twitter poll, you saw that. And yep. uh, I asked people, if you were in Congress, how would you vote on TikTok? Would you force divestiture? Would you ban the platform or leave it alone? You said leave it alone, I think, right? You said leave it alone. I said leave it alone. I said force divestiture. Most people are saying ban the platform, which is astounding to me. I mean, essentially force divestiture and ban the platform are the same. So it's like 67, about two thirds of the audience said that's what they want to see. I mean, it's essentially, this bill, if I understand it, is basically a, a ban the, the platform because no, the, the China Chinese government is not going to let Steve Mnuchin buy TikTok, right? But my point has always been about TikTok is we should insist on reciprocity. If our social media platforms can't operate in China unless they're divested, then we should say the same thing here. It's like I I don't know. Brendan, our producer, sent a text. Check the demographics on that poll. Probably not under the age of 30. So probably it's that would be leave it alone. They love the product. As a father and someone who wants to see people be more enriched with their mind and conversations, I'd say kill the, the app because it sucks you in. If <laughs> next thing you know, two hours are gone because it just feeds you like a pellets of content. And I know how my kids and, feel and, about it. They'd freak out if. And, they, and they, but they they love it. So you know the question is, do you, is is it harmful? And if you know, if you look at it from the perspective of, yeah, they're couch potatoes, but you can say that about TV when we were growing up. Like, oh yeah, it's, it's, these kids' minds are going to get fucked on TV because they sit there and just stare at the, the tube, um, and the boob tube they used to call it. So like, well, okay, whatever. What happened with TV? They they did other things. So TikTok will evolve because with you'll start seeing it evolve with ads. Now the question about TikTok is not so much the medium itself; it's that the Chinese are using it for surveillance. And, and for other uh, um, nefarious activities. So to me, I would only look into it, and this would be more of a off book, black ops uh, operation for the government, is just get in the weeds and just unpack the app and just quarantine it so it's not a national security problem. So to me, okay. you, know, you can't take the app away. People like it. But you can manage that. I, I hear what you're saying, but I don't think the argument is the, I don't think that's the right argument to make. I think you have to make an economic argument. And, what and, economic and, argument? And one of reciprocity. The economic argument is, look. But that's if, not if, our society. If, if China is not allowing our social media, US-based social media platforms to operate freely in China, unless they are 49, you know, 51% owned by the, the, the a Chinese company, then the same economic model should apply here. There should be reciprocity. But we're not dictators. Well, but, but, but yeah, we're not dictators, but but, but that's, yeah, China but our, is dictating that we can't. Yeah, we don't have copy them. Social media. They should copy and, freedom. And, well, but they won't. I know. So then, why should we allow a Chinese-owned company to operate freely in our markets? Well, I mean, that, to me, we to should put. My point is, we should put it back on China and say, here, here's your choice. You can either, you know, let our social media platforms operate freely in China, and then we will give you reciprocity here, or we will treat your social media platforms the same way you treat ours. I think that is a much stronger yeah. argument. I, mean, I would say take the whole thing over and just make it US based. But you won't get the algorithm that way. They won't ever give you the algorithm up. So, but my point is put it back on China, make them defend what that algorithm? awkward position. What of, algorithm? We're reverse, not going to let- Reverse engineer the algorithm. Well, why hasn't anybody done that? I don't think anyone's tried at you scale. Don't, you don't I mean, think Meta has tried? Of course, <laughs> but they don't have the volume that they have. Meta does. Not on TikTok. They have threads and they have uh, reels. 
on Instagram. Doesn't Meta have more active users than TikTok? I don't think so. I have to check on that. Meta's got like two billion active users. Well, the point the point is is that I mean, I'm not sure Meta wants to copy TikTok. No, not to be with Instagram. I mean, got, I mean, who uses Facebook? I, it, but is it Instagram, I WhatsApp. Guess, I guess here's the here's the point: is yet again the government's too late in coming in because it's it's the to Brendan's point, the, the young the young audience is not going to stand for this. They're going to and nor are some of the big investors. What if you were an early investor in ByteDance? This is the, this is also underscores the perils of investing in Chinese companies. What's going to happen if they actually force divestiture? What's your TikTok value? going to be worth? What's that valuation your investment going to be worth? It's going to be cut at least in half. Chinese officials say the U.S. has shown, quote, robber's logic towards TikTok and Washington must stop unfairly suppressing foreign companies. Yeah, they're so Financial full of time. shit. I mean, this is, they, what are you talking about? China suppresses foreign companies. That's what they do all the time. And so, I mean, I think you can't, and that's why I'm saying you have to make it about an economic reciprocity argument as opposed to, well, you know, it's bad for kids or whatever. Well, I mean, I not to go back to one of our early pods, we're on pod 50 right now, our podcast 50. I think on our first 10, we talked about Twitter being the next TikTok. Remember we talked about yeah. Elon's moves yeah. and, you know, him saying, hey, if, you, if the government shuts down Twitter, TikTok, then X could step in there. Um, and then Reels obviously came out, um, threads, I mean, with Facebook. So you are starting to see the Americans trying to position themselves, but, you know, it's, it's the question that comes up is, is it a foreign issue? This comes up also with AI. This is not well talked, discussed in the mainstream yet, but Vinod Kosla is on the side of AI is like the Manhattan Project. So we've all seen Oppenheimer, right? So the movie, uh, very secret. He's not too biased. He, he's <laughs> his investment he, in open he, AI. He thinks, <laughs> he thinks that it's, it's of national security that we hit AGI first as a, as a society. And that is the equivalent of the A-bomb, the Manhattan Project, that we should not open source it and keep it as a national security treasure and a asset and not open it up and well, the Chinese in. He's got and then we're like, well, come on. I mean, you think they're not gonna have access? And we, we reported last week that a Google Chinese person stole AI source code and was um, convicted by the DOJ. Um, so they'll, there's always been espionage. So the question is, can you even stop that? Or just make everything open and, and hope it's democratized? Um, it's a good debate. Well, I mean, it's, it's an interesting discussion. I never, I never thought about it, I know how I feel, but you know, my gut says always go stay open, but um, well, but there's what, an argument for like the Manhattan Project. Good point about open and innovation, but the the other the other point about Meta and what they're doing you know, with that Hammerspace announcement, I, it was Chris Meller's you know write up. He did a great job, but but they're pursuing AGI on an open platform, right? So to your point, that's I don't know how I feel about that, but the related, it's somewhat related, kind of adjacent here is the EU AI regulations. Did you see that? No, it basically. You know, once again, EU is leading in regulations like they did with GDPR. This one is, is basically, is, you'll love this. Basically, they're going to say, okay, this AI platform and this AI software is, it's either what I call red, like it, it's not safe, so it's not allowed. It's yellow, which is, there's some concerns, but, you know, we're going to manage them. Or it's, I wouldn't say green. I would say it's not, not red or not yellow. <laughs> okay. So, and so that'll be allowed. So, so I like the simplicity of that, but I don't know how you, um, first of all, define what is dangerous and red and not allowed versus what is, let's call it light, light green. Um, I don't know who adjudicates that. I don't know who's smart enough to figure that out. And how do you evolve that? Like, is it something like, okay, if, if something does a deep fake, that has to be watermarked and that's, a, that's mandated. Is that capability there? Can it be unwatermarked or is it immutable? I mean, I suppose there's things like you can do like that, but there's gotta be a thousand other things or maybe more yeah. that have to be adjudicated. So I don't really. Let me get your thoughts, Dave, on something that we brought up in a couple of pods ago. I wanna come on that point about now we have government issues going on. We always talk about that, but we predicted that startups would be falling out of the sky. The economy, Which would, be, is happening. The economy would be terrible. Less than peace fires is an all time high, um, but it's a weird market. Um, the economy, spending, IT spending, Outlook, um, we're getting some early signals from our, our our Cube research data and the startups. So let's, let's start with the startups. What I'm hearing is there's like a collection of companies on the verge of basically having no runway to end this year. So 2024 is going to be the, the, the vapor, the vapor um, fume date, as we say. The fume date is when you run out of fumes. It's like when you're driving your car, it's like, like how many lights miles? Lights on. 
Red lights on. Miles. I can make it. A55. <laughs> Conserve gas. Turn the AC off. Um, you know, push. So <laughs> when you're on fume date, weird stuff happens. You do think weird things. People leave. Boat takes on water, as they say. So you can see a lot of companies on that fume date. A lot of down rounds. A lot of uh, mergers and acquisitions in the startup world. A lot of failure coming. At the same time, the AI is still booming. So that's happening. IT spend. I'm catching wind that IT spending might be down, might be changing. What's what's your well, what, so I, what's your take? What's the research tell you? I know you've been digging so into it's this. So it's very it's really preliminary. I talked to the ETR guys this morning, and so they're still gathering the data. Uh, we're still hopeful that it comes. Remember, last year, um, December January, IT decision makers were predicting a 4.3 percent increase in spend, but very back end loaded. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so far. That's a, it's a little softer than that, but there's still the data still coming in. So we're mm -hmm. kind of hopeful that hopeful it gets back up there. But you know, it's, it's got a it's got a ways to run. Gartner <laughs> earlier this year came up with a forecast that IT spending would increase by eight percent, which sounds really robust. That would be you know what double GDP or something like that, maybe even more. Um, but I think Gartner might be including spending on internal staff. But so it's, it's early right now. I do think I would say this. Anecdotally, when I talk to customers, they are definitely squirreling away money for AI projects. And they're not sure what to do with it. You know, they're doing some stuff and they're doing some experimentations, but they're not going into production in a big aggressive way other than things like, you know, code generation and some chatbot stuff and, you know, summarizing text. I mean, all the basic stuff that you can do with ChatGPT. But in terms of bringing it in, building RAG, you know, like we're doing, you know, I, I would say we're still in the experimentation phase, John, right? I wouldn't say we're in, yeah. you know, high volume production for our, our RAG based for Cube AI. And so I think what's happening is people are squirreling away money because their top line budgets are not growing. And that right now is the fundamental. And we'll be reporting on this, you know, within the next. And you've years. always said that the money always is moving from one product to the other. We've been hearing that top talent has been moving off, you know, um, cloud native projects like Kubernetes and whatnot into the AI side. So you're starting to see some of those alpha engineers being pulled into AI. Yep. So you're seeing teams change. Um, so I can see that little squirreling away cash um, spend yep. hold back, especially right. as the big vendors like the Cisco's of the world are tool retooling their observabilities and, and the, the needs are changing as we report on super cloud. So I think we're going to be in this like tide shift, like mid tide, the tide's going to come in and out and you're going to see people you know, in between kind of this, you know, stuck in this, in this shifting of the winds. Um, what do you think about, you had, you had mentioned several pods ago uh, that a lot of the crypto developers moved into AI. Crypto's now, Bitcoin hit 73,000 this week. Mm -hmm. and, and I was saying, you know, hopefully the, there'll be a convergence of the, you know, crypto and AI will come together. What, what are you hearing in terms of the, the developer momentum now that Bitcoin is, you know, back up and, Ethereum's rising, people are talking well, about I Ethereum think, ETFs. I, I think um, the Bitcoin momentum has nothing to do with the developer action on crypto. I think that's an indicator that Bitcoin as a viable currency is legit. Um, and I think you're going to see more and more um, in, impact from the, uh, the Bitcoin market because let's face it, at 73,000, whatever it is today, there's people made a lot of money on Bitcoin who have Bitcoin and they need to put it to use. So I think you're going to see um, the Bitcoin billionaires become a very important part of the ecosystem and they'll probably come in and disrupt key markets around what developers do in terms of investment. I think you're going to see the um, new, new entrants come in, not just the classic VCs, but you're going to start to see a global, a global landscape of new players from crypto, Ethereum and mainly Bitcoin, who have made billions. And by the way, this is currency exchange. So it's like, okay, it's Bitcoin. So the question will be, can they get liquid? Can they put that into fiat? Can that convert that into asset classes like venture and real estate? So I think you're going to see a um, robust economy develop around crypto conversion, Bitcoin to asset classes. So I'm envisioning new VC funds coming in um, to deploy crypto value into an asset class venture deploying into, into developers. That's one. The other one's going to be the fact that now that AI is becoming new, a new infrastructure, I think you'll see those distributed crypto developers think about the problem space differently. I think they'll, they'll, they'll stay decentralized 
and that's going to needs to bake out a little bit. But I, I'm still bullish on smart apps, um, you know, D apps on top of a blockchain yep. for for certain transactions is definitely going to happen. No doubt in my mind that what we saw in 2018 and what we were building with KubeCoin, the idea that you would take the middleman out and create a immutable uh, transaction ledger is absolutely compelling. I mean, it's compelling uh, infrastructure. The question is the timing of it, what's the killer app, and can you get critical mass? And I think things like Google taking away search revenue from publishers will maybe create a new, new opportunity for the market there. This analyst relations thing we were talking about that could be completely reputation coin based. You know, let the market decide who's reputable. And then and then forget these these fake firms that do leader fake leaderboards. Um, um, that are out there that don't know how to get, really understand the valuation. Real reputation. That's, that's well, valuation of reputation is something yeah. that's never been done before. So, some, some interesting things happening with Bitcoin right now. There's a halving coming up in mid-April, so that's probably why you know people are so enthusiastic. Meaning, so what happens is every I don't know I think four years, uh, the algorithm that Satoshi, whoever he or she is, or they, um, <clears throat> basically cuts in half the the value that you get when you mine a Bitcoin. Okay, so that's, yeah. that's part of it. And then, but, and I don't even think of Bitcoin as a currency. I just think it is a store of value. Where, yeah. where it gets interesting is to your point is with Ethereum. So for those of you who don't know, you know, Bitcoin really is not programmable, right? But so uh, uh, the Ethereum founders, Anthony DiOrio who's been a Cube alum and, 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 and others, um, developed Ethereum with this programming language called Solidity, which is then programmable, which allows you to build D apps, distributed apps, which is to, to your point. Yeah. And so to, what I really like about what you're saying is as these big social media platforms like Google, you know, screw with the publishers, there could be um, a, 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 de a democratization of control over who gets rewarded. Right now it's backlinks and things like that and who spends the money on Google for AdWords. In the future, it could very well be some kind of open source like yeah. reputation algorithm that is really combines software engineering, cryptography and game theory <laughs> where the community decides who has the reputation and democratizes that whole dynamic. Yeah, I think that's a great use case and that's going to happen. The question is when, call, when it's going to happen. And I think the thing about crypto and decentralized infrastructure is the one problem that I see that's maybe stalling this is the fact that if you look at the growth of AI and all the cloud native work, the role of data is changing so rapidly, the velocity of it, how it's stored, how data is streamed. So the volume and variety and velocity of data is so fast, but it's so compelling as input into AI where there's real ROI on the table that will trump any kind of um, theoretical decentralized solution because the, um, the speed of that's going to be killer. Look at Snowflake, they popularized separating compute and storage. Right. That's going to change things like uh, Chronosphere out there and Rockset, we talk about these startups. So as this next level comes, that has to get set and that's driving more change at that infrastructure level. That will, that will, that will um, um, beat the, and the benefit to switch to decentralized because they can't handle the volume of data fast enough. So again, remember the old days of crypto. Do I need a database or need to have, is, is, is blockchain a database or is it like a system of record? And we argue that the databases, you don't need to use crypto for databases. So the database market right now is under major flux. Yeah. And so that's going to probably take and you're precedent right. over- too slow to use crypto or-, or AI, is moving, AI is moving way too fast, moving way, way too um, important with the value it's creating. And the database market's changing, so that's going to that's going to drive faster, and that's going to beat the crypto infrastructure in the short term. Now, Bitcoin as a currency, that's about wealth. And see, but I, again, I don't see it as a currency. I don't think you're ever going to be going to buy a cup of coffee with Bitcoin. I mean, it's, no, but you can move a billion dollars into a fund and convert into an asset so, class. So you know what? One of the most interesting angles I've I've seen recently, and this is this has been now well over a year old, is when MicroStrategy basically became a a, a crypto company, make like a, a, a crypto properties investor, right? MicroStrategy is an analytics firm, right? And this guy, Michael Saylor, who is the CEO of, of MicroStrategy decided, hey, we're going to take our free cash flow and put crypto, put Bitcoin specifically on our balance sheet. And you look at what that stock has done. So the other thing about Bitcoin right now is all these ETFs that got approved by the government and the SEC was fighting it, Gary Gensler was fighting it. Um, but Look at MicroStrategy is actually a great way to own Bitcoin without paying fees to these ETFs. But uh, 
but he's actually a really thoughtful individual. And, um, and I think that's a, a company to watch. They're no longer a software company in my mind. They take their software to throw off free cash flow so they can invest in Bitcoin. <laughs> well, I, well, I think one thing I walked away from the Jensen um, speech last week at Stanford was, again, this reiterates our theory, the power law of specialized models happening, software is the game, resources are going to go down to zero. There are constraints though, going to manage those systems. It's a systems game. They call it whatever, AI factory, but it's, it's really a systems game at this point. Um, and that's going to be the, the AI conversation for the next year, I think. You know, infrastructure, it, it's like the, it's the old classic three layers of stack, Dave. You know, infrastructure, middleware, applications. So you're going to start to see that kind of three-phase approach really form for AI and AI stack, AI native. And I, I have yet to see what a real AI native stack looks like. You got, you got software like CUDA for NVIDIA, but what does an AI stack, native stack look like for developers? So we're going to continue to do that and, uh, you know, pod, Maybe pod 70 will we'll hit there. We'll be there. Or maybe <laughs> 60, 10 more pods, 10 more weeks, we'll see. Um, but yeah, let's wrap this up. We got we to go start our day today. Um, next week's KubeCon. The Cube team will be there. On the Broadcom Financial Analyst Meeting, GTC, we'll be out here for that. It just lot, never ends. A lot of great and stuff, then, and, then, and the event season's kicking in, so. And then April is just, yeah, forget stay, about stay with us here on theCUBE pod. You know, we're going to bring you all the content we can, we've been seeing, all the analysis. Check out siliconangle.com and check out thecuberesearch.com. That site is formerly wikibon.com. That's now thecuberesearch. That's where you're going to start to see all the new analysts come on board, putting their content there. That's where the deep dives are. Check out thecuberesearch.com. Of course, Silicon Angles, where all the, uh, the millions of users a month go to. Um, and of course, youtube.com slash siliconangle for all the videos. That's our Firehose library. And of course, Twitter, SiliconANGLE, Twitter, theCUBE, and DM us if you have any questions or comments. Thanks for watching.